that works. Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Today we're going to talk no-till and minimal tillage potatoes. Uh, potatoes are one of my favorite crops to grow and eat. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what has worked and what hasn't for me, and a bit about how the research suggests we should be growing potatoes. So let's do it. All right, so it should be said there is no one right way to potato. There are people who simply lay them on the ground and cover them with a deep mulch of straw and have success that way. And there are people who bury them really deep and have success that way. I have had successes and failures doing both of those things, but over the last few years we have dialed in our potato system and I feel confident in telling you about it after several years of trial and error. And I feel confident that I learned some stuff looking at the research that may help all of us improve our potato production. Some of which I genuinely had never heard of before. Before I just start ranting about all those nerdy things I learned in my research, let's just go through the process I have found to be the most effective in my context for growing potatoes that requires little in the way of inputs. And then there will be plenty of stuff for the super nerds in the latter half of the video. First, uh, bread, bread. First, bed preparation is critically important, specifically for me, temperature. What I do for early potatoes is grow a winter killed cover crop, emphasis on that crop's ability to be killed by the winter conditions, uh, then tarp that area for several weeks. Is the tarp necessary? Uh, you could get away with not using it, but it does warm the soil slightly in the spring and help to sprout any seeds that are there. A big mistake growers make is to plant potatoes into too cool of soil. Potatoes don't want to grow or at least grow very fast in wet, cold soil. They will do it and they will put out roots, but ideally it's a little bit warmer than what we usually put our potatoes in. They want moderately moist soil that is in the 59 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit range. I mean, to be clear, you can grow potatoes when the soil is colder than that, but growth will be slow and slow growth can lead to disease and pest pressure. I try to get the soil as warm as I can leading up to planting. In fact, even if I was just placing the potatoes on the soil surface and covering them with mulch, I would still want that soil surface to be as warm as I possibly could get it in the early spring. When the seed potatoes arrive, it's ideal to place them near a window to allow for a little sprouting or chitting, which feels like a word I really have to enunciate. Some people go as far as to place them in egg cartons, which is fine too. You don't want super long white stems like this or they may break at planting. A stubby little sprout like this is ideal and there's research out there that suggests a yield increased and faster emergence when you sprout the seed pieces. There's also some research that says the opposite, but for the most part, the research is positive or at least neutral. A day or so before planting, which I do in mid-March here in Kentucky zone 6B for early potatoes, or by early June for late season potatoes. A few days before planting, I cut the potatoes into two or three pieces each, with each piece including at least two nodes. These things here from where the new plants will grow. I also found a little research that suggests you get smaller potatoes when you cut the seed potato, but planting whole potatoes would not be economically sensible, so you do more than likely have to cut most of them. I don't try to cut every single piece I can from a potato. In my experience, the potatoes do better when the pieces are slightly larger. I allow those pieces to cure overnight or heal slightly, which some research says can improve yields, though I don't know that that's really definitive. The day before I intend to plant, I will start my inoculation solution for beneficial microbiology. Specifically, the one I have found to be the most effective for potatoes is the Jadam microorganism solution I've talked about What's up, Goose? The Jadam microorganism solution. I've talked about this solution before, but it comes from the Jadam books and is basically where you bake a potato, smash that potato and place it into a breathable compost bag or cheesecloth or whatever you have, and dangle that in five gallons or so of rainwater or non-chlorinated water. Then you take a large handful of compost and place that in a separate bag, also suspended in that same water. I like to squeeze the bag a bit to work out some of the compost microbes and such into the water. Then I like to allow that liquid to sit overnight with the bags in it where bigger critters, the ones that aren't microbes, can't get into it uh, at a temperature of 65 degrees or higher, preferably closer to 75 or 80 until the liquid looks a little bubbly and smells like a very, very, very light beer. Uh, this solution will be drizzled over the potatoes at planting. Is this liquid essential for potatoes? Uh, no idea. But in three years of using this exact process, I've not seen a single potato beetle or a disease, so maybe? Now, I have tried several things for the actual planting part. 
I've tried pushing the potato pieces into the soil and covering them with a deep layer of compost, which was pretty significant failure, to be honest. Loads of greening occurred and yields were low and potatoes, beetles went bananas that year. And honestly, I was barely breaking even on the input cost, even if the potatoes performed very well. Uh, I then tried that same thing with hay to the same result. Low yields, high disease and pest pressure, low ROI. We don't have access here in Kentucky to clean affordable straw. Uh, so I've not tried that, but for the amount of straw mulch that is often recommended, it may be hard to justify the expense for some. Straw bales here are $12 a piece uh, if you can find uncontaminated straw, and so one bale would have to cover quite a few plants to justify it. Don't spend $6 to grow $10 worth of potatoes, in other words. That said, I did find a study out of Lebanon, the country, which makes strikingly good wines, uh, that used varying depths of straw to cover surface planted potatoes and found increased yields doing that. But they did also challenge the economic feasibility of doing it that way, and the plants were slower in production into production because of the coolness of the straw. They mentioned the economics would get better in the second year, but potatoes are not a crop I would recommend planting in the same place year after year, so I'm not sure that I would agree with that assessment. Also, we're more humid here. In Kentucky so that mulch would be gonzo pretty much by the second year interesting study nonetheless anyway I've also tried digging a six inch deep hole with a trowel then dropping the potatoes into that which was wildly time-consuming but the yields were slightly better so a few years ago to speed things up we just tried digging a trench and that's when things started to click for the potatoes it was fast and the potatoes grew quickly and healthfully. I've used several hoes to do this and I've used the rotary plow on the BCS when we needed to plant 1200 row feet of potatoes, uh, which was fast, but perhaps slightly more disturbance than I generally feel comfortable with. But plowing little furrows on the sides did still keep the middle intact, so that's good. Now, however, I do a little bit more preparation and I dig the trenches the day before planting to allow the soil there in the furrow to warm up slightly more. We then place the potatoes in with the cut side down at around 12 inches apart in the row, down to 6 to 8 inches deep. And that makes two rows on a 48 inch bed. It would probably be one row on a 30 inch bed. Next, I sprinkle a thin layer of good fertilizing compost over top of the potatoes. My mentor, Eric Smith at Bug Tussle Farm, told me that potatoes like a lot of nitrogen when they're getting started, and though I haven't been able to confirm this through research necessarily, it anecdotally has rung true for us for many years. So this is something I try to be conscious of at planting by putting that fertilizing compost right over the top of the potatoes. Then I drizzled the JMS liquid over the top of the potatoes and the compost to inoculate the furrows. Next, I pull some of the loose soil that's around and on top of the bed over top of those furrows just to make sure they are fully covered. If they do not get fully covered, they will green up. Last, I pull the tarp back over top of the potatoes to continue warming the soil and killing weed seeds until I see the potato buds breaking the surface, which usually takes about two weeks depending on weather. If my hay guy has leftover hay from the winter in the early spring, I will mulch them right when they are starting to poke through. If not, then I will just cultivate them until harvest. And that's been my process for several years and to great success. Now, people will ask me, what do you do about potato beetles? And I don't want to sound flippant or anything, but that process is my answer. That is what I do about potato beetles. So much of pest management is about those details, the soil temperature, the fertilization, the, the reduction or elimination of tillage, and addressing of compaction, etc. Oftentimes growers are planting tomatoes, for instance, into soil that's too cold, and then scrambling to figure out ways to fight aphids. Or we're not allowing enough space between plants and then googling how to stop fungal diseases on the leaves. People ask me how to treat pests and diseases in every crop video I do, and I always tell them that it's not about treating the disease, it's about meeting the crop's needs. Which rhymes making it a universal truth. That's how it works. If you're seeing potato beetles, consider offering the potatoes a nitrogen source like fish hydrolysate to help them break through that issue. Uh, apply some additional compost, make a good compost tea, and or some rich nutrient foliar spray. I can't guarantee any of that will solve the problem. The problem has to be solved before the planting. But hopefully it will help. If you want to learn more about soil management, consider picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook if you haven't already from us at notillgrowers.com because when you buy it from us, it also helps support these videos. It's a win-win. Yeah. For harvest, we sell about half of our crop as new potatoes, give or take. That's not uncured potatoes is all a new potato is. Oh good, a train. 
that's all the shorter season varieties because they often don't store as well. Um, so that means we start harvesting potatoes a few weeks before the crop has fully matured. We pop the plants with a shovel or uh, can often just pull the plant up with our just with the plant with the potatoes attached and just grub around for anything that we missed. Then we just allow those potatoes to sit for a few days before we sort of gently soak them in water and lightly spritz away any of the remaining dirt so as not to damage the young flesh. We harvest storage potatoes the same way by hand, but we're not doing acres and acres. If your soil is in good shape, it should be relatively easy to just pull them out or shovel them out or dig them out with a digging fork. Um, or, of course, a potato plow works fine too, though those can damage potatoes and cause compaction slicks of plowing when too wet, so just be mindful. I used to believe that you could just harvest a few of the potatoes around the plant and let the rest sort of size up, and I think to an extent that does work, but what I've found is that it's easier just to wait. You get a better yield if you just kind of wait until everything matures. For storage and curing, again, we don't cure the new potatoes, we just sell them, uh, but we do cure the storage potatoes. That said, we don't personally have a great option on our farm for that. A cellar is ideal where you cure the potatoes at 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit and very high humidity for two weeks and then store them at 40 to 45 degrees. We don't have one of those here. So we place potatoes in a cool dark place in our wash pack shed completely blacked out from the sunlight to avoid greening. We use a couple thick black tablecloths over top. Air movement is good and try to bang off excessive soil before storing them to keep your soil where it is um, and reduce disease potential in storage. Our goal is to build a storage spot for them eventually and for tomatoes to control the temperature. But as I'll discuss shortly, potatoes are not quite profitable enough to necessitate that for us yet. In the storage situation that I sort of described, you will only get a couple months storage out of them at regular room temp which usually works for our market season, but you, if you want them deep into the winter, you want something cooler. You can also bury them in a barrel or a tote for storage, but we're way too wet here for most of that stuff to work. They would basically just sit in water if it wasn't like a, you know, a firm tote. Okay, so every time I start really diving into the scientific literature, two things occur. One, I get bummed about how many helpful tips are buried in the scientific research. There needs to be a better mechanism for disseminating this information than just waiting on a lunatic like myself to dig it up or hoping Extension will do all the work for them. Anyway, the second thing that occurs when I look through scientific literature is that I learn some things that I can't wait to try out. The big thing for potatoes that I learned this researching season a thing, I think, was about the seed potatoes themselves and how to improve their profitability by increasing the number of plants per seed potato, but not by cutting them up more. You see, the method I described of cutting seed potatoes into a few pieces is effective, but it is not super profitable. Let's say that a seed potato cost me roughly $5 per pound for organic potatoes because we're certified organic. You can certainly find conventional potatoes for less, but for us, it's like $5 a pound. I'm going to get on average around 10 pounds yield per one pound planted. That means if I can charge $3 per pound at market for organic potatoes, that my net profit on potatoes per pound, not including labor, mulch, fertility, storage, or packaging, or any other costs, is around $25 per pound. That would mean in a nine foot bed space, I can grow something like $135 on lettuce, for an example, and do that twice over in the same amount of time it takes to gross only $60 once for potatoes. So it's a significant difference. Anyway, all that to say, the incentive to extend the amount of plants you can get off of one seed potato is really high because they are already an exceedingly low profit crop. And in the research, I discovered something I'd never quite heard of. The act of chitting or pre-sprouting potatoes is quite common and occasionally demonstrates an increased yield, as I mentioned, though variety arguably has more to say in the yield category than pre-sprouting, but anyway, so what I'd not heard of before, or at least not for regular potatoes, is called potato sprout planting. This is where you do one of two things. You either place the full potatoes or pieces of potatoes in sand or some basic potting medium uh, a few inches deep and grow the shoots up through it in a greenhouse or somewhere mildly warm, allowing them to form roots. Or you cut the shoots off of the sprouting potatoes and then place them in soil to form roots. 
To be clear, I am just now learning about this and experimenting with it myself this year, so this is not a recommendation, but I thought it would at least put it out there into the ether so you can run your own small trials this year if you get a chance. Emphasis on small trials there, in, in case that wasn't clear. And I want to do that because the research is pretty positive about the results of using this method versus planting the whole chunks of potatoes. There are a lot of technical details about optimum lengths and that sort of stuff, but the net result is that you get more shoots from one potato using one to three inch long sprouts. And various studies have demonstrated faster yields and higher yields, and not to mention an absolutely massive reduction in the amount of seed potato you would need. Indeed, this idea is very similar to sweet potato slips in that you're not using a bunch of potatoes, but the shoots from a small amount of potatoes. I can usually plant eight or nine of our beds with around 75 pounds of sweet potatoes. For regular potatoes to plant 800 row feet, it would take me roughly 150 pounds or more. So double. And at $5 per pound, double adds up quite a bit. So if I could do a similar slip process with potatoes and get them faster and at less cost, I'm in. The idea here is that all you have to do is get those roots to form on the sprouts, maybe form a few leaves, remove those growing stems from the potato, and separate each stem with roots and plant them. I will add some links in the show notes if you want to learn more about that process, and of course, I will update you on how my mini trial goes, so make sure you are subscribed. But I should say I could not find any layman description of how to do this, which yes is annoying. An enormous percentage of fully edible potatoes are replanted every year as seed instead of being eaten, and we're storing the information about how to potentially move away from that system in a giant pile of jargon. Assuming this is effective means of production, imagine how much food and land we could save and profit we could increase for farmers if we could go from getting maybe three plants per potato or four plants to getting an eight or a dozen or more. Especially if you do it in succession and just let those potatoes keep sprouting and with faster production. If you've tried this pre-sprouting method, let us know how it went or let us know what you think. There's a lot more I could say about potatoes, but since I am now running a small trial with the top sprouts, I will have other opportunities to expound on potatoes later on down the line. For now, I will have to wrap this up because I do actually have to farm at some point, but if you appreciate that I take the time to do these videos literally hauling a camera around the farm, often walking back and forth to turn the camera on and turn the camera off, shooting and reshooting my day as I work, uh, consider joining our Patreon page at patreon.com slash growers or picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com or merch or a hat. The money from those proceeds goes to making content like this. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye.